This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Hey, what's up? The best and the worst thing about the tomato is that it's only in season for like a hundred days out of the year. So it's very important to capitalize on that time. And in my mind, the best way to do that is to make them into a BLT sandwich. So today I'm gonna show you how to make a very good tasting bacon lettuce tomato sandwich. We're gonna make the bread, we're gonna make the bacon and a few sauces to moisten the whole thing up. To get started on the B part of the sandwich, I've got three and a half pounds or roughly one and a half kilos of thick farm raised pork belly. If you can get good locally raised pork belly, I recommend seeking it out because the flavor of the fat tends to be so much better and there isn't too much fat. Commodity pork bellies can be more than half fat, which sounds better on paper than it is in practice. Now, turning this nice belly into bacon is gonna start with a dry cure applied liberally to all sides. This style of curing meat is called EQ curing, where the amount of cure applied is based on a percentage of the weight of the meat. The belly here is about 1500 grams. So that's 35 grams of salt or two and a half percent by weight, 15 grams of sugar or 1% and seven grams of pink salt. That's a half a percent. And I'll throw a link to this pink salt in the description if you don't have any. Lastly, I'm gonna add in five grams of coarsely ground black pepper, but feel free to add whatever else you want at this point to flavor your bacon. I did a brown sugar maple cinnamon bacon for a future breakfast sandwich video. Basically, as long as the ratio of pink salt and salt stay the same, you can add pretty much any other flavorings you want. Once the pork belly is well rubbed up with cure, I'm gonna label a large freezer bag with two dates. One is today's date, and then the other is seven days from now, because this bacon is gonna need about one week in the fridge to get fully cured up. Seven days later, this bacon is all cured up, and that salt has done its job. It pulled out some of that excess moisture and really firmed up the meat. Next, I'm gonna rinse off any excessive salt that's sitting on the outside of this meat. That's gonna fully arrest the curing process and prevent overly salted meat from this point on. I'm also gonna dry this off with some paper towels to get this ready to be smoked we need dry meat, so I'm gonna give it a dab. Once I've got this dabbed up, it's gonna go into the fridge overnight. We're looking to develop what's called a pellicle. This is essentially a layer of proteins on the outside of the pork belly that make this meat tacky and ready to hold on to smoke. The next day, you can see the outside of this meat has taken on a really nice matte finish, and now it's ready to be smoked. Let's go to the chief. Outside, I've got my aluminum electric smoker, AKA the big chief preheated out here. And into it, I'm gonna load the pepper bacon as well as that slab of cinnamon maple bacon that I mentioned earlier. The little wood chip tray on the bottom of this thing is smoking hot at this point. And into that, I'm gonna add three solid handfuls of soaked medium sized applewood chips. And I'm gonna top that with a big four to five inch chunk of soaked applewood. The beefier piece of wood on top is gonna raise the temperature of the smoker and give us more smoke for longer. It takes a solid 90 minutes to two hours to burn through a piece of wood like that. So I don't need to check on it as often. Now I'm gonna smoke these bacons for six hours total. So for me, that's three long, slow rounds of wood chips. If you were using something more finely shredded like these, you could be up to six rounds of chips. Smokers are all super different in terms of smoke time. My big chunk wood philosophy here seems to be paying off nicely though. The smoker is staying firmly around 200 to 225 degrees Fahrenheit or 94 to 96 C. And after six hours of gentle, hot apple wood smoke, these bellies look good enough to pull off. Letting them dry out in the fridge overnight really helped them take on this super deep amber reddish color. Now I'm gonna pull these off and bring them back inside to check the internal temp. I prefer to hot smoke my bacon, meaning that these bellies got cooked all the way in the smoker. They should be about 160 F or 71 C roughly is what I would call done. In my experience, hot smoking bacon makes a bacon that renders faster later on, but more importantly, it's gonna be much easier to slice by hand at home than cold smoked bacon. That can be a little bit mushy. The last step here is to press this stuff as it cools down. For that, I've got another sheet tray. I'm putting that on top and then I'm gonna add 10 pounds of weight on top of that. But of course, that's not all we need to attend to here. The vehicle is just as important as the bacon and I can't abide just any thoughtless loaf for this sandwich. So of course, we're gonna make one specific. For that, into the bowl of my stand mixer goes 350 grams of warm water, three grams of instant yeast, 530 grams of bread flour, 12 grams of sugar, 20 grams of olive oil, 125 grams of very ripe poolish. What's that? To make bread more flavorful, we ferment some of the flour and water ahead of time. We call this a pre-ferment. To make this one into a medium container, I measured 65 grams of room temperature water, a small pinch of yeast, probably like 30 to 40 granules, and then 65 grams of bread flour. That's gonna get stirred up to combine, and yes, it should be kind of gloppy like this. The lid goes on, and I'm gonna ferment here on the counter for 24 hours. The next day, we've got a beautiful, boozy, ripe little poolish that is ready to make our loaf of BLT bread taste so much more interesting than just a straight dough. Feel free to direct 
directly sub in sourdough starter here for the poolish if you're a sour patch kind of kid. Lastly, into the mixing bowl is gonna go 11 grams of salt and then the dough hook goes on and we're gonna mix this on low speed for three minutes or until the water and flour have combined nicely and this is actually starting to knead. From there, the speed's gonna go up to high and I'm gonna continue to mix this for six more minutes. And if you're out there mixerless, I've got you. Of course, you could mix this by hand. The mixing process is essentially the same as it is for any other hand mixed dough you've seen on this channel. Everything goes into the bowl. I'm gonna stir that up to combine with a sturdy spoon. Then from there with a wet hand, I'm gonna come back and squeeze and pinch everything together just until it's very well combined. The fermentation time for this hand mixed dough is the same as the stand mixed dough, but folding will happen three times in total instead of two. After six minutes on high speed, the dough in the mixer is now ready to roll, but does it pass the tug test, Bri? Yes, this tells me the gluten in this dough has been brought to its full potential. Now I'm gonna move it over into a medium bowl and let it rise on the counter with a lid for two hours. 30 minutes into that two hours, I'm gonna come back and do a little folding to the dough. If you've seen a lot of my videos, then you've seen me fold a lot of dough and you know the deal. It's pull it out, fold it over four times while rotating the bowl. From there, we're gonna roll over and tuck under the dough until a nice tight ball is formed. In my book, the strength building fold is usually essential for making dough strong enough to shape. Once it's tucked up and looking taut like this, the lid's gonna go on and we're gonna check back in 30 more minutes. Now, at that 60 minute mark or halfway through the fermentation period, we're gonna repeat that strength building fold that we did just a minute ago, the same as before. Pull it out four times, rotating the bowl, then tuck and roll it into a nice taut little thingy. That looks good. The lid goes on and we're gonna check back in one hour. In the meantime, I wanna thank the sponsor of this video, Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that takes nonfiction books and puts them into 15 minute audio and text versions called Blinks. They have Blinks for pretty much every interesting nonfiction book in a wide variety of topics like science, psychology, self-improvement, and philosophy. Undergoing a digital declutter begins with a 30 day break. I signed up for Blinkist about a year ago, and since then I tend to listen to these Blinks while I'm in the car in between places. The grocery store is exactly 15 minutes or one Blink away from my house, so I can do one on the way there and then another on the way home. But if longer form audiobooks are more of your style, they also have those, and usually for cheaper than what you would pay elsewhere. And another way I use Blinkist is to decide if I want to invest more time in the longer form version of the books that I'm listening to. If I'm inspired by the ideas that I hear in the Blink, then I'm really likely to just move over to the audiobook part of the app and buy it. So if you want to give it a try right now, the first hundred people who go to Blinkist.com slash Brian Lagerstrom will get unlimited access for one week to try it out. And if you like it, you'll get 25% off when you sign up for the full membership. So check it out and thank you Blinkist. After that one hour, the dough for this sandwich bread is all gassed up and looking quite alive. And over here, I've got a medium large or one and a half pound size loaf pan that I'm going to prepare for the dough by liberally squeezing olive oil all around the inside. Now to get this dough ready for the pan, I'm gonna flour the bowl, then my board, spread that flour out, and then flip out the dough. Next, I'm gonna actively degas this because bread flour is super strong and can hold on to gas like crazy. Too much of that gas could lead to huge open voids in this bread later on, so it's best to pop anything large with force now. Now to shape this loaf, I'm gonna grab the bottom third, pull it out and then fold it up about two thirds of the way to the top. From there, I'm gonna pull out the bottom right, fold it over to the left, then pull out the bottom left, fold that over the right. Now I'm gonna grab this whole thing and turn it 180 degrees. The top is now the bottom and I'm gonna pull that out and start to roll it over. Every time I make a rollover, I try to tuck back and seal in any tension that I created. Once this is rolled up into a nice taut little tube like this, I'm gonna grab my pan and transfer this loaf over seam side down. Now I'm gonna cover this with another loaf pan because I have it, but also a tea towel works. And now I'm gonna let this rise here on my cutting board and off the stone counter for one hour. After that hour, this loaf has risen about an inch and a half over the edge of the pan and it's looking ready for the oven. Now I'm gonna score this loaf on the diagonal four to five times all the way across. If you don't have a razor blade like this, a serrated knife will also work, but probably not as well. Once that's scored up, we're gonna load it into a preheated 425F or 218C oven and bake it for 40 to 45 minutes. After that 40 minutes in the oven, this loaf is fully baked throughout and ready to come out of the oven. You guys, this loaf is everything you need to make a nice, simple little tomato bacon sandwich or any other sandwich for that matter that you want to be delicious. Now, once this has had a chance to cool off a little bit, it's time to pop it out of the pan. And when I cut into it, you can see that this crust is not very crisp at all. And I'm very happy about that. The loaf here has a nice tender interior crumb with a ton of mellow yeasty sweetness. And it's just all around a great vehicle for many different foods. Okay, now it's time to get serious about making this into 
into a sandwich. Let's get back to the bacon. I cheated and sliced my bacon on a slicer because I have access to one, but since we cooked this bacon to 160F, it is firm enough to slice it with a knife by hand. I go quite thick because I like bacon that eats more like meat, but dealer's choice on the thickness, thin is also cool with me. And if you don't have homemade bacon, don't fret. We all know store-bought bacon is also a great tasting food. So if you find a thick cut bacon that you like in the store, go for it. But the way we cook this bacon is actually a lot more important than how thick it's sliced. We're gonna lay this out on a wire rack on a sheet tray and then bake it in a 350 degree oven for about 30 minutes. Rendering it like this in the oven gives us bacon that lays flat on a sandwich and it renders it much more evenly. After 30 minutes of baking in the oven, we finally get to see what this bacon is like in its end state. It smells so, 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 so good. It's crispy, deeply smoky, and yes, definitely worth the effort. Now, to get the bread ready for this sandwich, of course, we need to toast it. And for that, I'm gonna lay it into a large nonstick pan. Into that pan goes about a tablespoon or two of rendered bacon fat straight from the sheet tray because, you know, flavor. And I'm gonna toast this as gently as I can or just until the bread is very lightly dehydrated, a little bit crisp and just barely starting to brown. Once the backside of this bread's got a very, very light toast on it, it's time to build the sandwich. Beware, the first thing down on this bread is very untrad for a BLT. It's pesto, and it turns out that pesto tastes very good with tomatoes. To make this pesto into a fruit processor, it goes 100 grams of toasted and then cooled pine nuts, 100 grams of grated Parmesan cheese, 30 grams of minced and rinsed shallots, 20 grams of parsley, 100 grams of basil, 30 grams of lemon juice, 5 grams of salt, and 225 grams of chilled olive oil. I'm going to spin it up until things are well broken down, probably about 25 to 30 seconds, and there we go. This is not an Italian grandmother's pesto, by the way, because lemon, food processor, there's onion in it, but it is very well well vetted. I've been using this recipe in restaurants for years and I really love it. So a bunch of this pesto goes on my BLT. Up next is the bacon that we made. I'm going to shingle that in a thoughtful way across the bottom to promote structural integrity. Behind that bacon comes two perfect slices of fully ripened tomatoes. I've hit these with a liberal amount of Malden salt and cracked black pepper. And on top of that comes a thin slice of a full heirloom tomato. Use something exotic and colorful, something really fun looking. That's going to get some salt and pepper as well. And by the way, I got these tomatoes at the farmer's market mainly because unless you grow them yourself, getting something of this quality is just not possible with the current supply chain that exists in any store. Those heirloom tomatoes that are there aren't that good, unfortunately. So if you're near a farmer's market, you need to treat yourself. Behind that tomato comes a huge pile of shreddice, basically a combo of green leaf and iceberg lettuce is shredded as finely as we can get it, then refreshed in cold water till they're firmed up and then we're gonna spin off all the excessive moisture. Now, finally, to top off this sandwich comes some DI DIY Miracle Whip. I know that sounds crazy, but I grew up on that tangy zip and I love the zippy tart sweetness of a sweeter mayonnaise on my tomato sandwich. So to make this into a high sided container goes one large egg, five grams of salt, 25 grams of white distilled vinegar, 20 grams of water. The water's in there to make sure that people who are new to mayonnaise don't break their emulsion on the first try. And then comes the sugar. This is the thing that you could leave out if you don't want this to taste like Miracle Whip. Just don't use it. It will taste like classic mayo without. Now my immersion blender goes in to spin up the eggs and stuff and then I'm going to slowly stream in 325 grams of neutral oil. In this case, I'm using a light colored olive oil. And there we go, homemade tangy zip. How do you guys like that? Now, put a bunch of it on there, like a bunch. That looks good. Now to finish this, that goes on the sandwich and a gentle but firm little squish seals it all in there. And oh my Lord. This sandwich can only exist at this high level for a few short weeks per year, and it's up to us to seize the moment and really enjoy it while it lasts. Let's eat this thing.